In our age of increasing specialization, the term Renaissance man is applied too readily to people who happen to demonstrate one interest outside the area for which they are known. But Gordon Campbell is truly a Renaissance man, and not just because he is a very distinguished student of the literature of the Renaissance period. It is exceptionally difficult to summarize a man whose publications alone cover art, architecture, the Bible, classical antiquity, gardens, Islam, legal history, music, and the literature of many periods and countries, and who is without question the most traveled person in this hall today. Gordon was born in Surrey, his mother coming from minor gentry with a Royal Navy background. So far, so conventional. His father, however, was a Canadian entrepreneur of a rather buccaneering type. It is perhaps fanciful to see in this combination of propriety and adventurousness some of the influences which shaped the learned scholar with a thirst for travel and a readiness to pursue new business opportunities. Gordon himself would argue that stories about history and places told by one of his teachers were a more important stimulus to his wanderlust. After the war, the family moved to Canada, where Gordon took his first degree at Waterloo University and a master's degree covering both English and theology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Attentive listeners will note this early evidence of an unwillingness to be confined to one discipline. Serving as a bartender at a Shakespeare conference, Gordon asked where he could continue his studies in the UK and was directed to the University of York, a distinguished centre for Renaissance studies. His supervisor, Dinos Patrides, proved a demanding mentor of a sort which those doctoral students in today's audience may not have encountered and which Gordon characterises as benign neglect. Supervision meetings were rare, but when they occurred, his work was shredded for two hours. The commitment to rigour and resistance to academic laziness have been consistent features of Gordon's intellectual life. The successful defence of his thesis on the 16th century logician Peter Ramus was followed by a first international academic appointment at Aarhus in Denmark, where he was greeted with the announcement that there was no syllabus, so could he have a go at 18th century poetry, nature poetry. This was followed by five years at the University of Liverpool, and then in 1979, encouraged by an old friend, Professor Sandy Cunningham, he came to this university, where he was promoted as Professor of Renaissance Studies some years later. In the English department, the Father Christmassy figure of our honorand was a popular and stimulating teacher to generations of students, his special subject of Milton attracting many more participants than might have been expected. And his fellow academic staff have found him a good-humoured, generous and supportive colleague. But a larger stage was always bound to beckon. In academic terms, this has meant participation in a range of learned societies. The list of Gordon's fellowships is considerably longer than those printed in today's programme. His chairmanship of the Society for Renaissance Studies reflects the standing he has in his own field, while the election to a fellowship of the British Academy is the highest honour in the humanities as a whole. The Warburg Institute in London, the foremost institute in the world for the study of cultural history, is perhaps its real intellectual home, providing a place for dialogue with leading scholars from the many disciplines to which Gordon contributes. His international activities also defy summary. As he puts it, he has travelled with scholarly intent to all seven continents, taking in countries from Antigua to Uganda, Japan to Nepal. For this university, he pioneered international student recruitment in the early 1980s, when it was not common practice in British universities, so laying the foundations for the diverse multinational student community that Leicester now enjoys. Gordon has not limited his activities to places of safety and prosperity, as is illustrated by his work in South Africa, where he advised on funding inequities, in Beirut, where he was the first British academic visitor to venture there for 15 years, and in the West Bank, 
where he helped Palestinians in need of higher education after the Intifada. The precise nature of Gordon's international work has remained mysterious to colleagues in Leicester, though rumours do abound. What is clear is that his understanding of the Islamic world, combined with negotiating skills, has made him a highly regarded advisor to the British government in the development of agreements in that region, to which he has made over a hundred visits. As founding chair of the British University's Iraq Consortium, he chaired meetings at ministerial level in Baghdad. He led negotiations with the Saudi Minister of Higher Education as part of a mission with the then Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw. And he has drafted a cross-governmental strategy for the support of education in the Islamic countries. His publications as author or as editor similarly illustrate the breadth of his interests and his impressive intellectual grasp. Quantity is not the only measure of this, but it is noteworthy that he has some 27 books to his name and at least 100 articles, many on Milton, plus several thousand individual entries in the encyclopedias he has edited. In the last decade alone, his publications include John Milton, Life, Work and Thought, the Grove Encyclopedias of Classical Art and Architecture and of Northern Renaissance Art, Bible, the story of the King James Version, and The Hermit in the Garden, from Imperial Rome to Ornamental Gnome. Unsurprisingly, he was involved in planning the reburial of Richard III in Leicester Cathedral in 2015, delivering a diplomatic eulogy. And he chairs the Cathedral's Fabric Advisory Committee. He now spends much of his time in the USA where he is responsible for substantial sections of a new Museum of the Bible opening in Washington later this year. Despite all his academic achievements and his international activities, Gordon has been a committed family man, sharing many of his travels with Mary and devoting himself to his children, who are with us today, and to his grandchildren. With Mary also he finds time for choral singing, of which I hope we will soon be given an example later in this ceremony, and to tend a beautiful garden and an allotment, though he credits Mary with this last. We honour Gordon Campbell today for the scholar and teacher that he is, and for his rare erudition, his remarkable energy, his services to international understanding and to the university. For the past 14 years, Gordon has stood at this lectern as public orator and delivered some of the most eloquent orations heard at this university. Cicero, one of the greatest orators of all time, said, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. One suspects that Gordon Campbell would echo that, but he would also insist on his passport and an air ticket. Today's orator cannot rise to the standards of a Cicero or a Campbell, but is privileged to say, Mr. President and Vice-Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present Gordon Roy Campbell that you may confer upon him the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters. Vice Chancellor and President, Lord Lieutenant, Lord Mayor, colleagues, fellow graduands who have worked for their degrees, and families. I thank my friend, the public orator, for his kind and eloquent words. I thank the university for this extraordinary honor. The list of those whom this university has honored with the degree of Doctor of Letters begins with E.M. Forster and includes luminaries such as David Attenborough and Desmond Tutu. I'm frankly astonished to have been added to the list, but I am delighted and hasten to accept before a mistake is discovered. 
I'm particularly pleased to be receiving this honor, this honor in the presence of my ever-supportive family in the balcony and my ever-supportive colleagues and our Lord Lieutenant on the stage. Now, I've been here for a long time, happily serving the cause of education for which I have voted with my life. When I arrived almost 40 years ago, the University of Leicester was a very different institution. It was a Midlands University that served the Midlands, and its reputation extended about as far as Oadby. It had fewer international students than any university in Britain. Now it has a global reputation, it attracts students from all over the world, and in the international league tables, as the Vice-Chancellor explained, is always near the top of the list. I think it's worth reflecting for a moment on how these changes came about. In my view, the most important factor has been the university's leadership. I've served under a series of immensely skilled vice-chancellors and registrars, and their work has been enhanced by good advice from chairs of council and treasurers who are the unpaid servants of the university. These are the people who have created an infrastructure for excellence in research that has transformed our global reputation. They have also insisted on hiring ever more qualified staff. For the, so the younger members of staff now are markedly better qualified than was my generation. I don't think I would have got a job competing with today's entrance. The same people have consistently insisted on the importance of honoring the interests of our students. That means good teaching, but it also means personal support. When I arrived here, Lester felt a bit like the Dr. Barnardos of the university world, in that lecturers were counselors and careers advisors to their students. Now those functions have been professionalized, but the sense that we care about the well-being of our students has remained in place. Student satisfaction has now been institutionalized in surveys, but in the past we assessed it less formally. It was my practice to see my students individually at the end of the semester to ask them how they'd felt about the course. If I had succeeded in my attempt to make them trust me, they could be immensely helpful, sometimes inadvertently. I remember asking a, a student how she felt about our series of English Renaissance literature seminars. She replied that she hadn't enjoyed them at all. I pressed her on the reasons, and she replied that much of the time in seminars, we were talking about five topics, religion, love, sex, politics, and death. And these were not proper subjects for polite people to discuss. <laughs> I thought this was a rather shrewd uh, account of the preoccupations of Renaissance literature. And for many years thereafter, I opened the course with a lecture on the refractions of religion, love, sex, politics, and death in Renaissance literature. The number of students has grown over the years, and the student experience at Leicester continues to be a happy one. There has of late, however, been one unhappy development. My colleagues on the platform did not pay for their education, and indeed many had maintenance grants to sustain them at university. You have had to pay fees, and you emerge as graduates with an enormous burden of debt. No other country in Europe, including Scotland, imposes fees on university students. Successive British governments that have imposed and then raised fees have, in my view, acted shamefully, in effect creating a tax on knowledge and skills. <laughs> and they should hang their heads in shame. These fees are also an intergenerational justice, because those who enjoyed free education are not being required to contribute to the cost of your education through taxation. Now, it's customary on these occasions for honorary graduates to offer a few words of advice to graduating students. It's difficult to do so without sounding pompous or platitudinous, both qualities of which come naturally to me. So I will instead 
issue you with two challenges. First, your degrees have given you knowledge and equally importantly, analytical skills. These skills have been transformative in that you are all different people from the versions of yourselves at the beginning of your courses. These skills will make you employable, but they have also endowed you with the capacity for active citizenship beyond your job. You have educated views, but also the potential to act on those views, and I challenge you to do so. Join a community group, or a political party, or a charity, or support a cause that is dear to your heart. Having opinions is not good enough, even if they are educated opinions. Do something about it. Such actions have enriched my life and can enrich yours too. Secondly, I challenge you to defend Britain's universities and to support this university. Never forget the fine education that you have received here, and in time to come, do all that you can to assist this, universities, this university and to enable others to enjoy the same advantages. And remember that you carry with you, wherever you go, the good name of the University of Leicester. Many thanks. Thank <laughs> you.